Well, welcome everyone. My name is Matthew Maynard. I'm with Hemophilia Ontario and I'm the Provincial Coordinator for Adult Services. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce Dr. Carcao and um, he will be speaking about the extended half-life products and how they impact uh, um, uh, for both Hemophilia A and B and how they impact um, uh, the treatment and care of um, folks with uh, bleeding disorders. Dr. Garkeo is, uh, is medical director at the Bleeding Disorder Clinic at Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto, as well as, um, and I will keep this short, Dr. Garkeo, but an avid researcher um, in a variety of um, uh, both uh, clinical trials as well as applied research um, with uh, bleeding disorders and acquired bleeding disorders. So Dr. Kirkeo, with that introduction, we'd love to hear what you have to share. Okay, well thank you very much uh, uh, Matthew and um, welcome to all of you. I, I obviously don't know who's on and who's not on. Um, but hopefully there, there's a lot of you on. It's always a little bit nerve-wracking to sitting by oneself in one's dining room and speaking, not knowing uh, if there are actually people on the other end of the call, but I do think we do have some. So I was asked by Hemophilia Ontario to talk about um, <clears throat> the impact that extended half-life concentrates, factory concentrates, have had on patients with hemophilia A and B and and clearly, my um, talk is really focused um, based on my own experience at the Hospital for Sick Children and what's happened in the last year and a half at our institution. Um, so that really will be the focus of this uh, one-hour talk. Um, and I've done this in such a way that I think we'll have lots of time for questions at the end. Um, I'm not going it, to – it's too difficult uh, to take questions as I go because I obviously can't see any hands going up in the air. I'm only looking at my screen and I see my slides and that's what you'll see. So I'll have to take questions at the end and hopefully over the course of the hour I will um, address many of the questions that you might have as we're going through this. So um, you can see the title here on the first slide. Hopefully everybody can see the slides. And I'm going to start off, um, instead of uh, right away going and telling you about what the experience is, I do want to review this for those of you who aren't as familiar with some of the extended half-life products. So on this slide, I'm showing you the various extended half-life factor eight concentrates that are available. And you'll see that there are four extended half-life concentrates that have either been approved uh, in Canada or are still in development and not yet approved. So um, the first one uh, is Eloctate. And that is a product that's made by BioVerative, which used to be known as Biogen. And in Europe, this company is known as, so it's not the same company, but there's a partnership. And in Europe, it's Soapy. And they have an FC Fusion Factor 8. It is recombinant, uh, as are all of these that I'm showing you here. And the other ones, the other three extended half-life factor 8s are all pegylated products. And that's why I put them all in the blue color. But they are different. Um, uh, they have different amounts of peg on their... Uh, on the product. They're all recombinant products, uh, just like Eloctate in that sense. But the difference clearly is that Eloctate is an FC fusion. The other ones are pegylated products. However, despite the fact that they're all different, they all prolong the half-life of factor by about 1.5 fold. So if you take uh, a patient who's on Advate or Cogenate or Zintha or something else, and if you switch on average, they're half-life would be extended by 1.5 fold. So they would go from 8 hours to 12 hours or 12 hours to 18 hours on average. doesn't mean that every patient does that. So what does that mean for the average patient? Well, for the average patient, it means that currently if they are receiving um, a recombinant factor 8, and on average most patients on recombinant factor 8 like Advate or Cogenate or Zintha are on three times a week or every other day. And if they move to an extended half-life factor eight product, the average patient would be able to reduce the number of infusions 
from every other day to, in average, twice a week. Um, and even by reducing to twice a week, they would still be able to maintain trough levels of about 3 to 4 percent after three days and 1 to 2 percent after four days. Of course, if they were on twice a week, they probably would choose a Sunday, as you can see there, as that would be a very convenient day to give it. And then their next dose would probably be on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Um, and no longer would they generally be doing infusions every other day. Now, the extended half-life factor nines uh, are shown here and their various attributes. So again, there is an FC fusion product also made by Viveritiv, and this is known as Alprolix. There is an N9GP product, which uh, is not yet available in Canada, and, but it has already received a label, a name to it, and it's going to be called Refixia in Europe and Rebenine in North America. And that's made by Novo Nordisk. And there is a product, Idelvion, which is licensed in Canada, but as yet that has not been made available by CBS. And, that's called, and that is made by CSL Bearing. Now you'll see that these products are all very different, hence the different colors. The FC Fusion product, a Pegylated product, and an Albumin Fusion product. You'll also notice that uh, in terms of the extension of half-life, these are uh, much more, uh, they, they will extend or prolong the half-life of factor nine much more than what we're seeing with the extended half-life factor eight. So you're looking at a prolongation of half-life in the case of Alprolix by about three to four fold, and in the case of the other two, by five or more fold. So a tremendously extended half-life in comparison to what we've had in the past with standard factor nine. So all of these do allow for once a week dosing or even less than once a week, so once every two weeks or maybe even less than that. Now, as shown on the slide is the steady state trough levels that would be um, encountered if, you're, if a patient is on these products. So with Alprolix, if a patient receives 100 units per kilo every two weeks, <clears throat> at the end of the two weeks, right before their next dose, you generally have a trough level on average of about 1%, which is low, and they would still certainly be vulnerable to bleeding. With uh, Alprolis, once a week at a dose of 40 units per kilo, they would have a trough level of about 3%. Now with the other two, you'll notice that the trough levels that you can uh, achieve are quite uh, higher than what you can achieve with Alprolis. So with all of these four regimens that I've shown you over here, three of which are once a week dosing, one of which is once every two week dosing, you can achieve steady state factor nine trough levels of 8% or over. And on top of that, and notice that the 8%, by the way, was with 10 units per kilo once a week with 9 GP or now known as refixia rebenine, um, which is remarkable, such a low dose. Um, and also with Idelvion, the studies that CSL Bearing have done shows that you can give 75 units per kilo of Idelvion every two weeks. And at the end of two weeks, right before your next dose, you have a steady, on, on average, a steady state trough level of 12%. I should preface this that these are in adult or adolescent patients. In young children, the steady state trough levels are a little bit lower than this. And notice that with once a week dosing, with a reasonable dose of about 40 units per kilo, with these two products, you can achieve steady state trough levels of 20% or over in the case of the Novo Nordisk product. So these are remarkable trough levels. These are trough levels that, for the most part, patients would not experience any bleed um, at all and certainly um, would not experience any spontaneous bleeds, um, needless to say. So what, was, what does this mean? Well, currently with a product such as Benefix, which is a standard factor nine, on average, patients are receiving two doses per week with this. Some receive more than two, some receive less than two, but on average, the vast majority of patients are on twice a week dosing with Benefix. And with any of these extended half-life products, they certainly can go to once a week dosing, and, and that would mean that their number of infusions would drop from 104 infusions per year with twice a week dosing to 52 infusions per year with once a week dosing. On top of that, particularly with the Novo Nordisk product, Refixia, uh, also known as Rebenine, or with Idelvion, I think that certainly the vast majority of patients could probably get away with once every two week dosing if they so wished. And that would reduce the number of infusions that they would have to do 
from 104, which is what they're used to, to 26 infusions per year. And that's a remarkable drop. And on top of that, all of these infusions could certainly be done on a weekend, uh, a Saturday or Sunday, where individuals are not rushing around to get to work or to get to school. So I think that this is a remarkable change and, and a vast improvement. So with that, as a, as a uh, caveat to what now I'm going to talk about and it's sort of a prelude, uh, I want to talk about sort of the last year and a half um, in Canada and also uh, in particular at the Hospital for Sick Children where I work. So Health Canada actually licensed Alprolix and Eloctate a long time ago. This was now three years ago, <clears throat> or over three years ago. So in March 2014, Health Canada licensed Alprolix. And for those of you on the call who do not know this, um, actually Alprolix was licensed in Canada before it was licensed anywhere else in the world, including the United States. Uh, Eloctate was licensed in Canada at the same time that it was licensed in the United States in July 2015. You know, recently, a Dynavate, or more recently, a Dynavate and Idelvion, a Dynavate is made by a Shire and Idelvion by CSL Bearing, have recently been licensed. But uh, as yet, they're not yet available, that, but that might change in the next year or so. <clears throat> now, um, I think most of you know this, but for those who might not, all factory concentrates in Canada are bought and made available by only two organizations. One is Canadian Blood Services, which represents all of Canada, um, except for Quebec. And in Quebec, the um, <clears throat> corollary to Canadian Blood Services is HEMA Quebec. So it's these two organizations and only these two organizations who establish contract companies and buy the products and then make them available to uh, patients in Canada. So last year, in uh, roughly uh, February and March, CBS in Canada, or outside of Quebec, and I'm focusing uh, because of sick kids outside of Quebec. So CBS agreed to supply Alprolix in March of last year, and he locked it at roughly the same time. So when that happened, and all the clinics were informed, including our clinic at the Hospital for Sick Children, we had to decide what course would we take. How would we react to this information? So we at the kit sent all of our patients uh, letters informing them as to the availability of the Loctate and Alprolix. Obviously, the patients with factor eight deficiency um, received a letter regarding Loctate, and similarly, those with factor nine deficiency received a letter regarding Alprolix. We felt it was a duty uh, on our part to advise our patients as to the availability of any and all products. We also indicated on the letter that if they wish to switch to these products, they would need to meet with us and or to discuss by phone this uh, possibility. <clears throat> so what happened after that? Well, some patients, but not many, some patients, some families, contacted us indicating that they were interested in switching to a Loctate or Alpro. But as I said, there weren't that many, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But very shortly after that, as we were sending out these letters informing people that Eloctate and Alprolix were now available or would be available, we were also informed about further CBS changes. Uh, and these changes were based on national, tender, uh, national tenders that they had had for factor. And so one of the changes was that Cogenate FS uh, was, to, was going to be replaced by Covaltry. And for those of you who don't know, Covaltry is similar to Cogenate FS. Uh, it's also recombinant. And you can think of it as maybe an improved Cogenate FS. But in, in general, it's a very similar product to Cogenate FS. So we, again, at that point, we felt that we had to inform, obviously, our families who were on Cogenate FS uh, about the switch, and so we indicated to them that unless we heard from them, because we felt that these two products were very comparable, that they would automatically be transitioned to Cavaltry. So at some point in the next number of months, um, when they would go to pick up Factor instead of picking up Cochinate FS, they would pick up Cavaltry. But we re reiterated on the, the, the second letter that they could, however, switch to some other product if they did not want to somehow uh, stay with Cogenate fs dash But then there was another change, a second 
change that was announced at roughly the same time, and that was the withdrawal of Advait. And I always had to tell patients why it was being withdrawn. Um, you couldn't sort of hide, and you couldn't sort of say, well, there's something wrong with Advait. There's nothing wrong with Advait. Advait was, um, was fine, and it was as fine now as it was a year ago or two years ago or five years ago. But um, essentially, CBS got a better price for Zinta, and with the tender system, they decided to switch um, from Advait to Zinta. And CBS did inform the clinics that, uh, for the most part, they were hoping that patients who were on Advait would switch to Zinta. So again, we sent another letter. So we were doing lots of letters during this time. So we sent a letter to all of the patients and families on Advait informing them that they would need to switch to some other factor eight. <clears throat> and again, they would have to discuss this with us. And so you can see right away that there are essentially two types of patients, um, not only in our institution, but in all institutions throughout Canada. So it was the coach and ADFS patients, and these patients were patients who were not forced to switch. They could simply stay on cogenate, which would then become covalvi. And they did not have to make any active decision of switching. But then we had the Advait patients, and these patients were forced to switch. So they had to pick an alternate product, or somebody had to pick an alternate product for them, but they had to switch. So we needed to have a discussion with our Advait patients. We certainly did not tell them that they would be switched to a specific product. We did not in any way say to them, we're going to switch you all from Advait to Zintha, as we were instructed. We were, I, I certainly was not prepared to do that at all. And instead, we wanted to speak to them about the merits of all available recombinant factor eight concentrates. And so at that point, the available concentrates in Canada were the following. Eloctate, which is considered an extended half-life product, Cavaltry, which is not considered an extended half-life product, but it is a, maybe a superior form of cogenate. Nuvic, which is a newer product, and it has some um, things about it that may make it better uh, than older products, and Zintha, which has been around for a long time. And remember, this one is the product that came with the best price. And we explained to the, the patients in a very non-directive manner um, that they choose any of these products. They were free to choose. And I think that this is a very important concept, that, that it was, the choice was theirs. It was mine to make. <clears throat> However, many families, of course, would ask, Often question. They would ask this question of me when I would meet with them, and they probably asked it of some of my colleagues as well. Um, what would you do? And so, you know, this is a, an important question. I think uh, this is one of the most important questions in medicine, particularly when you're dealing with children. And I have children; they don't have hemophilia, but they're children. Um, and um, and so, what when I'm asked this question, what would you do? I simply think. What would I do for my children? And so my answer was the following. If it were my children, the less needles, plus hopefully a slightly higher or better trough level, the better. And I would switch my children to a lactate. Um, and one could argue, well, is the advantage enough? Uh, enough for what? If there's an advantage, and if there's even one less needle per year, I as a parent, would still prefer one less needle per year. Maybe taxpayers may not, but that's not my issue. My issue is my own children, and such issue is my own patients, and and, uh, and I regard them as, as if they were my children, and the decisions made for them should be the same as I would make for my own children. So what happened as a result of all this? So here I'm showing you the patients that had oncogenate before all of this happened. And as you can see here that of the patients on cogenate, these were patients who were not forced to switch. They could switch if they wished, and 20% of them did switch. 20% of the patients on cogenate in the first six months, and I'm, I'm really focusing on what happened last year. Since last year, we can talk about that sort of in questions later, but this is what happened really in 2016. And so 20% of the patients that were on cogenate switched to a locked And you'll notice that that's not a lot. 
and uh, I'll mention that in, in a few slides, but 80% of them simply stayed on cogenate, or later on, as time went on, they simply moved to covaltry. So it really indicates that when patients and families, particularly families, and I, you know, I deal with children, of course, and so in many cases, it's the parents who are making the decisions, clearly. Um, perhaps maybe the 15, 16, 17 year olds, they themselves are also contributing to the decision, but for the most part, really, it's parents who are making the decision. So when patients and families and parents are not forced to switch, on our children, because we're fearful. fearful that by switching, something could go wrong. And if they seem to be doing well, then let's not rock the boat. And so this is what happens with the cogenate, or what happened with the cogenate patients. They weren't forced to switch, they just simply stay on cogenate. And if they were doing okay, then they didn't want to rock the boat. Now what about the patients on Advate? These patients were forced to switch. And now you can see what happened. So none of them could stay on Advate because that was no longer going to become available. So as a result, 94% of our patients that were on Iloxid, on Advate, when given the free choice, when they could choose, they weren't told what to switch to, they were simply given the choice. 94% of them chose to switch to Iloxid. 6% of them did go to Zinta. <clears throat> and you can argue why, and we can discuss that at the end. The vast majority, almost all of them, switched to uh, eloctate, and so this is very different from the cogenate. The cogenate patients were not forced to switch; these patients were forced to switch. And so, when when they're forced to switch, patients and parents will, in general, switch to the product that they perceive to be the best for their children if they're given a choice. <clears throat> and um, essentially, when they would ask me, what would I do? it would be what is best for my own children. And so 94% of them felt that it was best to switch to Eloctate. Now, one of the questions is, okay, so these, a lot of patients switch to Eloctate. As I, as I mentioned, 20% of the cogenate patients, 94% the Advait patients. So that's quite a lot. So in total, in that first year, since then we've had another 10, 15 more patients, perhaps 20. But in that first year, up until sort of the end of December, of last year, 45 patients switched to Eloctate. And so now what I'm showing you here is their use of factor prior to switching and then after switching. So prior to switching, when they were on a standard half-life factor rate, on average, our patients were receiving approximately 102.2 units per kilo per week, or on average, roughly 33, 34 units per kilo given three times a week. That was sort of the average uh, regimen that our patients were on. When they switched to Elotate, the average patient was using roughly 85.1 units per kilo per week. And although I didn't put it here, on average, the, uh, the average patient was using twice a week dosing at roughly 40, 42 units per kilo per dose. Um, and so there is a, a savings on the number of units used by about 17% drop in the units per kilo per week, or you can translate this into units per kilo per year, or just simply units um, uh, versus units uh, used before switching and then units used after switching. And there was a drop of about 17%. Now, uh, what I'm showing you here is um, the usage per patient. So we categorize patients as in did an individual patient decrease their usage or increase their usage or essentially made no change? And in order to define what was meant by an increased use or a decrease in use, we used roughly 10 units per kilo per week, meaning if you were receiving 100 units per kilo per week and you, um, after switching, were using 95 units per kilo per week, there's really no difference between 95 and 100. It was only if you dropped that to less than 80, so if you went to 80 something, then we would consider that to be a drop in usage. So now I'm just gonna show you, did any patients actually use more 
uh, units of Eloctate and they were using units of primarily Advate, did any patients use less? And four patients actually used more. So when they switched to Eloctate, they actually were using more factor than before. Twelve did not change. They were using basically the same amount or plus or minus 10 units per kilo per week. But the vast majority of patients, so 29 out of the 42, decreased their use by at least 10 units per kilo per week. Now, you may uh, ask, why did four patients increase their use? And really, this has to do with the fact that they're pediatric patients more than anything else. So children grow. And so from uh, one year to another year to another year, their weight is going up. And so we, we have to increase the use um, as patients um, uh, are uh, getting uh, bigger. And what happens is, let's say that you put a patient on 30 units per kilo per week, uh, or 30 units per kilo per dose right now. But two years from now, if you haven't increased their dose, as their weight has gone up, their uh, use in being now 30 units per kilo is probably now going to be 24 units per kilo. So you actually have to increase the, the, uh, their use at that point because they weren't using enough on a per kilo basis because their kilos had gone up. And so you have to readjust the dose as um, patients uh, increase in size. And so in a couple of years, you have to readjust the dose. So that's, uh, for these four patients, much of that has to do with that. You readjusted upwards their dose based on their current weight. And then the other thing is that a few of these patients were having too many bleeds and uh, felt that they actually needed to escalate their prophylaxis. And some of this were patients that were on one week, still young, and we increased their dose. Now, what I'm going to show you here is the regimen that patients are on pre-switching and then post-switching. <clears throat> so pre-switching is the regimen that they were on with their standard uh, factor rate product. And many of you um, on this call either have hemophilia or are parents of children with hemophilia, and you can sort of put your, yourself or your child into one of these categories. So of the 45 patients who were on um, a standard half factor eight, one of them was receiving it daily. Not a lot. I know that in other clinics in Montreal and maybe others that there are more patients on daily factor, but our patients um, have not generally um, to be on daily factor, uh, so daily needles. 24 of our patients every other day. So that was the vast majority. That was more than 50% of our patients. Nine were on three days per week. Ten were on two days per week, and one was on one day per week. And the ones on two days per week or one day per week, younger patients, point where they're still escalating over time their, um, uh, their uh, intensity of prophylaxis. And so now I'm going to show you once they switched what they went to. So first of all, the ones at the bottom. The patient that was on once a day, I'm oh, sorry, one day per week, stayed on one day per week when they went to uh, Eloctate. The uh, 10 patients that were on two days per week, 10 of them went to two days per week. Some of you may be asking, did you not consider putting them on one day per week of Eloctate? And we didn't really because we didn't feel that one day uh, uh, per week of Eloctate in young children knowing that their half-lives are a little bit shorter based just because they're younger would be sufficient, so no. Now, you'll notice that uh, in red are patients that, if they had moved to that, would have meant that they would be receiving more frequent infusions, and nobody was receiving more frequent infusions um, uh, by moving to Eloctate. Now, what about the patients that are on three days per week? Well, two of them, we moved to every three days, and seven of them, so the vast majority, to do two, two days per week. The patients on every other day, um, they were kind of split between the two days per week and the every three-day regimen. Uh, there was a little bit more on the every three-day regimen. And the patient that was on daily went to every three days. And that's a vast difference from being on daily to every three days. So overall, of our patients, once they moved to Eloctate, at the bottom there of this slide, 18 of them were on every three-day infusion. 26 were on twice a, uh, a week infusion, so that was the vast majority, and one patient was on one day per week infusions. So the total number of infusions uh, of all of our patients decreased on average by one infusion per patient per week. 
Now, you may ask, is that significant? Well, I think it is significant for the patient and for their family. Now, for society, maybe not. But, um, you know, when we sit down with the patient, we're not thinking of society. We're thinking of that patient. So it does mean reduction of 52 needles per patient per year. And if you do the math over a lifetime, this would be a lot, although really over the next 10 years, everything's going to change anyway. But nevertheless, even for a few years, it is considerably less needles. So, other, so for all patients that were switching, we made sure that they would use up all factor at home for switching. We didn't think that it was appropriate to somehow, um, uh, even if they said, we want to switch right now, that they would, we, we would just end up throwing away all that factor that they would have at home. Because no, they had to use it all up. We also insist that the first dose of Eloctate would be given in hospital. Not that anything ever happened. There was never any reactions to it. But um, we wanted to do this. And part of the reason we wanted to do this is we wanted to do an initial recovery meaning that um, an hour after giving them Eloctate, we took a sample of their blood to see uh, how high their factor level would rise Eloctate. And I'm not going to show you the data for that, but it was essentially as expected. Um, was from 15 out of the 26 age CDC centers. So that obviously means that 11 centers hadn't switched any patients during that time period whatsoever. Now, furthermore, of the 139 patients who did switch to an extended half-life product, 96 of them, or 96 out of the 139, or 69% were children. So they reflected the, the vast majority. 95% of all patients as well who switched were on prophylaxis prior to switching. Now, from what I had already said to you before, you can see that sick kids accounted for a great many of these patients. Because in sick kids, we had 52 patients who uh, last year had switched. 45 of them had hemophilia A and they switched to Eloctate, and seven had hemophilia B and they switched to Alprolex. So we represented 52 of the entire group and this, cor uh, this corresponded to 54% of all children. And it also corresponded to 37% of all the patients who switched to an extended half-life product. And we were responsible for 41% of all those who switched to Eloctate and 23% of all those who switched to Alprolex. So clearly, in Canada, clinicians uh, last year viewed this very differently. And in some clinics, as I mentioned, 11 clinics, no one switched to an extended half-life concentrate, at least last year. Now, perhaps this year, things are a little bit different. So one of the questions you may ask is why? <laughs> why at sick kids did 52 patients switch? And in, some, in many other clinics across this country, zero patients switched. And I think it's because patients weren't given a free choice to choose. It, it, is, it makes no sense to me. If patients had been given a free choice, they were at sick kids, it wouldn't be possible that 0% would have switched to Eloctate, that nobody would have switched to Eloctate. I can't believe that in a clinic, I'm, I'm not going to say names of clinics, but in any clinic, if you have 50 patients and you offer 50 patients the choice of switching, 
to any of the following, lactate, Zinfil, Cogenate, or Dash Covaltry, or Nuvik, that none of them would choose Elactate. That just does not make sense. Um, when in sick kids, 94% of them chose uh, to switch to it. Um, you know, families are not that different across the country. They're all interested in what's best for their children. So you couldn't have such a discrepancy. That would not be, uh, make sense. So I don't think that in many clinics they were given the choice, at least not last year. Again, this year may be very different, and, uh, and, and clinics are now much more likely to switch their patients. So Canada-wide data, but much of this was from sick kids. This is what uh, the Canada-wide data showed in terms of usage per kilo per week, or basically usage per patient. So of those patients who switched to Elocate, um, and these were uh, patients that all had severe hemophilia A, and of the 62 patients, 45 which were from sick kids, prior to switching, their average use per kilo per week was 101 units. And post-switching, it was 82 units per kilo per week, or a drop of 19%. Um, in sick kids, we had a drop of 17%, so they're very comparable, and, and part of that is because uh, we constituted the majority of these patients. With respect to the patients who switched from... Um, from uh, an, a standard half-life factor nine, so these are the patients with hemophilia B, and for whom this data was available. It is, hello. This data wasn't available for everybody, um, but for those patients who switched, um, before switching, their average use of mainly benefits was 105 units per kilo per week, and with Alprolix, it was 53 units per kilo per week or a drop of 50%, and we had a drop of 40%. But in children, as I had mentioned to you before, as their weight goes up, you, you will tend to use more. So I'm not surprised that in children, the drop in isn't as much because um, you adjust upwards uh, your dose as their weight goes up. So um, this is pretty well uh, ending this uh, talk, and unfortunately, it was interrupted. Um, but have these switches been successful may be a question that some of you may be asking. And um, so some of the questions you may ask that pertain to this um, bigger question is, are they bleeding less? Are the patients that we've switched to these products bleeding less? And I would say there's probably no major change. Maybe they're bleeding a little bit less, but remember, they're using a lot less factor, less frequently. And so it may not be that much of a surprise that they're not bleeding much, they're not bleeding less. Um, but they're not bleeding more, and they're using a lot less infusions. So are they receiving less infusions? Yes, absolutely. Are they content? Uh, it's hard to ask them that question. Uh, we do, uh, but I haven't asked every single patient. But the answer seems to be yes, and mainly because no patient has gone back to the original product that they were on. But it's still early. Um, and I'm going to end it with this, but I will say that what I, what I presented to you was really the data from 2016. But this year, in 2017, we certainly have had another 10 to 15 patients who've transitioned to Elocate and another 5 to 10 patients who've transitioned to Alprolix. So, yeah, yeah, the last year and a half has been um, quite a lot of transitions of our patients. So with that, I'm going to end this, and um, I want to apologize to, to all of you for the, whatever happened with the audio, and I'd be pleased to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Carcao. The problem was uh, on Matthew's end and not on yours, so no apologies necessary. And we only lost four attendees, so really a testament to uh, the benefit of the information you are sharing. And thank you so much on behalf of all of the participants. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone sent a question to Matthew before he was disconnected, so if you did, please feel free to resubmit again through chat to me or to everyone. The only question I saw was, uh, Dr. Carcao, do you have any sort of insider information about um, the direction CVS will be taking with regards to extended half-life products in the upcoming tender process? No, I don't have inside information. Um, it, 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 no, it, the bottom line is no. I, I will tell you, my own personal thing is not even so much the immediate um, you know, future, but the long-term future in not just Canada, but in the United States, in, uh, in Western Europe, is that um, we're going to be treating hemophilia very differently in the next three, four, five, six years. And uh, so change is inevitable, and change will occur. Um, 
And it may not even just be to extended half-life, but I do think that this is probably the first step and there will be more changes. So um, I don't know what CBS will do this year, but do I think in the next number of years that they will certainly make I mean, they've already made the Loctate available. It has been available, <laughs> and Alperlex has been available. But will others be available? Yeah, I, I do think that as the years go by, you know, more and more things will be available. And, and then, of course, extended half-life products will compete against each other as well for, for the market. Yeah, so um, but change is inevitable in the next number of years. Other questions? I am going to unmute everybody. Sorry, um, I'm going to unmute everybody just in case there's anybody who wanted to ask a question um, without using the chat function. 